Well, with the last spring holiday just ahead of us, which will be tomorrow, brethren, or basically with sunset, so that means in several hours, so with that last spring coming to us, we become aware of how different we are and how different we are to become than our old person, our old man or our old woman. We become, you know, aware of how different we are to be from the person or persons we were. Of how much is, of whom much is given, much is required. I'm sure that we know for that, about that verse from the Bible. And that is the reality of God-fearing believers. Now, brethren, all over the world, people are casting off restraint. That is also the reality. The old standards are disappearing rapidly because the knowledge of God is disappearing in our modern world. In the past, many people in general at least acknowledged God's existence. They had some basic knowledge of God. And when the knowledge of God, however, slides away, people become lovers of themselves and they cast off restraint. Now, Lot lived in an awful society. Noah also lived in a very difficult society. We, brethren, also live in a very difficult global society today. Let's read in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 4. Hosea is one of those minor prophets we are going to cover one of these days. And Hosea's book, brethren, is basically the history of the house of Israel. Not the house of Judah, but the house of Israel. Hosea chapter 6 verse 4, O Ephraim, now Ephraim is the leader of the ten tribes of Israel, which are often called by their leaders Ephraim. But of course we know that the direct descendants of Ephraim today are English people and English-speaking people. So that means England, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and those who might have remained in South Africa. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? And then he addresses Judah as well. O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goes away. Well, brethren, you see, the faithfulness of both houses of Israel, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, their faithfulness to God's instructions just burned off like fog in the early morning. It was there for a little while, just long enough to impact their lives a little bit, and then it melted away. So we are seeing the same generational slide today. In the next verse 5, God says, Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like light that goes forth. So God had warned them through the prophets that they would be cut down if they didn't return to him and stop following the reasonings of their own minds. Verse 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering, brethren. And the knowledge of God, God desires more than burnt offerings. And keep in mind, this is said in the Old Testament. So even there in the Old Testament, those who were led by the Spirit of God, King David, as well as prophet Hosea, they did understand that the burnt offerings and offerings and the sacrificial system wasn't really what God desired, that he added that because of the hardness of the heart on the part of Israelites, and that God always desired mercy more than that, mercy and not sacrifice. So we see that, that he also you know, desired the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now mercy or any other good fruit cannot happen without first having the knowledge of God, brethren. We have to have the knowledge of God in the last verse of the book of Judges, we read that Israel forgot God. You know, they were close to God sometimes in that period of Judges. And then they would just go into decline and where they didn't have any fear of God in that decline. Judges, that's the last verse in 21, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And exactly in that brethren setting that everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes, using the reasons of their own minds, happened an amazing story that we will analyze tomorrow for the first time, I think, in the history of the at least continuing Church of God, will be the book of Ruth. But Israel, in the time of Judges, brethren, whether they had a judge or whether they had later a king, they were just prone to forgetting God. That is the carnal, the human way to go. Man, brethren, along with all of us, tends to follow his own reasoning. And we tend to forget, forget God, and forget the knowledge about God. You remember the, I told you, the longest, the longest commandment in the Decalogue is the fourth one. Remember the Sabbath day, and it's very long, because why? People just forget it. The house of Israel certainly 
was very prone and happy to forget that commandment. And of course, after the day of Pentecost, the day of the first fruits, the feast of the first fruits, we'll be having several more messages about the Sabbath keeping because I've realized, and you have told me, some of you, that it is a very urgent matter to be covered. So anyway, man, in its carnal way, led by Satan, tends to follow his own reasoning. So basically, Israelites, in the days of Judges, they came up with their own solutions, which inevitably failed, because man's solutions, brothers, are never really any solutions. In this time of the year, we focus on living according to the knowledge of God, while living in a world that is very rapidly going in the other direction. Now, we have in the Bible several inspired examples of others who successfully did the same thing. So we're not to be discouraged. We have the good examples there. Now, of course, one of those great examples is the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is full of great lessons and parallels of people living well despite the world around them. This book is a breath of fresh air compared to so much of Israel's history that is recorded in the book of Judges. Now, it is believed that Samuel was the one who wrote the book of Ruth, and we know that most of those listed in Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter, are physical descendants of Abraham. Most, but not all. For example, Rahab, she is listed among them. Now, Ruth is not mentioned in Hebrews 11, but she was also not an Israelite by birth. It is a very positive story, and it was happening during the barley harvest, which ended with the day of the first fruits, or which is commonly more commonly known, the day of Pentecost. So this is time. This is a time when people were doing what was right in their own eyes. The knowledge of God was vanishing from their culture. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 2. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, and he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Chilion, Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Now, as names tend to be significant, brethren, here is what they mean. Elimelech means God is my king. Naomi means pleasant. Even though in the Serbian rendering of, uh, of the best Serbian rendering of the Bible, it says even beauty or pleasant. So it could be, you know, pleasant, but pleasant, you know, a person who is a pleasant outlook or pleasant personality. Their son's name, Mahlon, means infirmity, which does make sense because basically the whole family died out, except for Naomi. And Chilion means finished or completed. Now, there are some significance. They will talk about that tomorrow on the day of first fruits. Verse 3. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Mahlon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. So brethren, now consider the impact on Naomi's life. She experienced famine. Now, she has experienced the death of her husband and her two sons. Imagine how that would impact us. It would appear that Elimelech died not long after going to Moab, so we see some real tragedies in the life of Naomi. Now, Orpha and Ruth have also incurred tremendous stress at an early age because, you know, they've lost their mates. Now, this is a huge trial for these three ladies. But now, at this point, Naomi has heard that the famine has lifted back home and determined to go back to Judah. Verse 8, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. Now, brethren, Naomi has given her daughters-in-law some very practical and selfless advice. She was not a widow of wealth. You know, they had not done well in this country. There was very little that she could offer them physically. And after all, they had their own families. They had their own mothers that they could go back to until they could perhaps be married again. So Naomi was really the one who needed the physical support because she was aging. 
Yet, you know, the beauty of this person and her personality is her selflessness. You know, there was no real reason for her daughters-in-law to stay with her from a selfish perspective. From a normal carnal perspective, there was no reason to stay with Naomi. Verse 10, And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. Now that's kind of startling, you know, statement. When, you know, they had their own families that they could go back to. Why would they say that? Well, Naomi was obviously a very loving person, a present personality. And one of the lessons in this book is the impact of a loving person that a loving person can have on others. Naomi obviously had won their hearts. So in the face of leaving their mothers, their own country, their culture and religion, they still wanted to go with her. So brethren, this is a powerful example that Naomi set for these young women. Now they obviously had seen something different in, in her compared to the rest of the world. Something different in this pleasant woman who feared God. Verse 11. But Naomi said, Turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters. For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So now Naomi talks about, you know, here about raising sons to illustrate the point that there was nothing there for them. There was no reason for them to stay with her. What she said was actually based on the knowledge of God's law. It is there in Deuteronomy. You know, if, if a man dies and re, a widow remains behind, his brother or the nearest kin was supposed to take up the widow as his wife to raise the name of the deceased. So she, what she said to her daughters-in-law was based on the knowledge of God. She wasn't running on her own reasoning, brethren. And that knowledge of God guided Naomi through all the phases of her life, whether in good or whether in bad times. Now in verse 14, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. But truth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. In other words, Naomi actually said, What it is you want to do with your life? Now this was a huge decision for them. Naomi was doing the very same thing, brethren, that Jesus Christ done sometime later. We see an example of it in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 8 verse 19. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Well, just as these two young ladies had initially said, We will follow you. We'll, we want to go where you go. But in verse 20, and Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So what he was saying, basically, brethren, was, look, you can follow me, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be in your comfort zone. Oh, we well know what Jesus Christ meant by those words, brethren. It wasn't that Christ didn't desire this man to follow him. And certainly it isn't that Naomi didn't want, perhaps, her daughter-in-law to be with her. Jesus Christ desires that all people should follow him and come to repentance. And I'm not mentioning Jesus Christ in vain, brethren, because out of Ruth's line later came the very Messiah in whom we believe and who died for our sins. Jesus Christ came out of Ruth's line. But certainly Christ, even though he wants all men, all people to follow him, he designed us, brethren. He knows how we think. He lived a physical life among us as well. He knows the things we go through and he knows that a shallow or maybe an emotional desire to commit to this way of life won't last. And we see that also in the example of Orpha and Ruth that we'll be mentioning tomorrow on the very day of the first fruits. There are some good lessons we can learn as part of the Church of God Brethren from the book of Ruth. And because we are celebrating the foundation, the beginning of the Church of God tomorrow, I'll leave some comments about this book for you tomorrow on the very day that we are celebrating our beginning our foundation so it's beautiful to know that our roots 
as far as the church, go back to Jerusalem. And we're a continuation of the Jerusalem early church of the first century. And that's something else that we need to keep in mind. We're a continuation also of all the other previous church eras before us. We're currently living in the Laodicean era, but we're living as a Phila or we aspire to live as a Philadelphia remnant in this Laodicean age. But we're a continuation of the previous era of Philadelphia. We're also a continuation of all the other five church eras that preceded Philadelphia. Now, in any case, Jesus Christ said to this man, count the cost. And you all know very well, and those, who, those of you who counseled with me, that before baptism, you know, you were counseled by me and I was counseled by before my baptism to count the cost. You know, we're counseled to count the cost and that is in essence the very same thing that Jesus Christ was telling this scribe. If you're going to commit, understand that this way of life isn't going to be lived in your old familiar comfort zone. Now in Matthew chapter 19, you don't have to go there, but you remember certainly Christ counseled a very wealthy young man who also wanted to have eternal life. And that man said, if, and Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have to give to the poor and come and follow me. Now, brethren, that ended, you know, the young man's interest. He went away sorrowful because he was a very, very wealthy man. Now, this is the same thing that happened to Orpha. You know, Naomi put the facts out in front of her and Orpha made a decision. She didn't fully want to commit to that way of life. Because it takes deeply, a deeply resolute choice to follow God, brethren. And yes, it takes some boldness to do it in the face of the rest of the world. Naomi knew her daughters-in-law had to fully make their choice for themselves. So she didn't push for anything, you know. Nobody could make it for them. The fact that she, you know, what she said here is what Christ would later to do tells us that her wisdom was based, again, brethren, on the knowledge of God. Now, Orpha very obviously loved Naomi, but wasn't fully committed, so she went back to her people. She went back to her gods, to the different culture. As you know, the Moabites were idolaters, but the fact that it says that she went back would indicate that while her husband was living, she followed the God of Israel, but was not fully committed. Just like to say in a passing comment, there are people who just come into contact with the Church of God, stay there for a while, but they're not fully committed, brethren. And then eventually they'll leave. And there is a reason why they'll leave, of which I should make mention tomorrow. Because again, we can draw some very precious lessons out of the Book of Ruth, and we should. Even though we rarely, if ever, quote that book in our sermons and messages, they're precious lessons for us as God's people in this book. So, Orpha wasn't fully committed. She returned back to her gods, to her people. On the other hand, it says that Ruth clung to Naomi. She would not allow a separation. She had, you know, she had also family that she could go back to. She had all the same circumstances that Orpha did, but she was committed to something else because she counted the cost and made that decision. So in chapter 1 verse 16, but Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I'll go. And wherever you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything, but death parts you and me. So yes, of course, Orpha loved Naomi, but Ruth was fully committed, brethren. There are people who love the Church of God and the uh, company of the members of the Church of God, but they're not fully committed. Ruth was fully committed, and of course, the love between her and her mother-in-law was mutual. Her mother-in-law would need care as she aged. In verse 17, she said that the Lord do, do, do so to me, and more also, if anything but death separates us. So she pointed out that God was the one she was really thinking about in this entire exchange. She is choosing based on the fear and the knowledge of the God of Israel, brethren. That is why her decision and her decisions were sound. She was staying with the knowledge of God. So all this came under the umbrella of the God of Israel. And yes, we're never ashamed to call him God of Israel. That's who he is. 
And we are never ashamed to call ourselves for what we are. We are spirit-led Israel. That's what Ruth had to become as well, to be part of God's people. She had to become a physical Israelite. In our day and age, brethren, we who turn to God of Israel and His laws and His way, we become spirit-led Israelites. And we are celebrating that, giving of that same power to become spirit-led Israelites tomorrow, or basically actually in several hours. So one of the lessons of the book of Ruth is to realize just how powerful a faithful example can be to an unbeliever. I'll remind you that in Matthew 5, 16, Christ said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They don't see brethren and Father in heaven. Nobody has ever seen him. But they can see the people whose lives have been changed on the earth by the Father in heaven. And then people will glorify the Father in heaven, not all, but some, those who see our good works. Now, a very definite part of Ruth's decision was undoubtedly based on how Naomi had lived her life. Now, that would, without question, have been a huge influence. It hadn't been an easy life, brethren. Ruth had seen Naomi go through lots of stresses, first losing her husband and then her only two sons and living in a land that was foreign to her. And throughout all of these upheavals, her love for her daughters-in-law was never questioned nor the dedication she had to the God of Israel. It was never questioned. Now, of course, you know that the mothers-in-law have gained quite a reputation all over the world for how they behave and what they are. So the fact that this woman was different from all, from all that and she was a pleasant personality obviously made an impact on those of her immediate surroundings. So through, through, you know, through the years, more people, brethren, I have to remind you, have come into God's church as a result of the example of one of the members of the church or more members of the church than by any other way. Yes, indeed, brethren, we are preaching the gospel. Yes, it seems that the more people, however, yet it seems that the more people have come in by personal example than by any other means. What that means is, brethren, when the knowledge of God is expressed through our actions, People, make sure, notice. When we walk by faith, it is uncommon and people notice it. Brethren, sometimes in our company, people can just listen to our conversations. We don't even have to mention the word God or Jesus Christ or Bible. And they will realize that there is something different than us. No swearing words. No shallow conversations. No superficial ideas. People realize there must be something different. That means that we let our light shine in our communities. Now, another of the lessons of or parallels of Ruth is that her break with Moab is, brethren, certainly typical of our own break with the Egypt of our past. We all came to the point where we believe and we feared God and we clung to him through the woman, through his church. Because, as you know, woman in the Bible is a symbol of the church. In particular, in Revelation chapter 12, you don't have to go there, but I'm just, uh, just going to remind you. The first woman, described with 12 stars, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, is the modest and the true church. Then, in the second part of that chapter, we find the rising of Satan-led so-called Christian church. And in chapter 17 of Revelation, we have that woman, the harlot, which whores with foreign gods with paganism that woman whose uh, whose chalet or whose uh, cup is filled with the blood of the martyrs of jesus brethren that's a symbolism representation of the second woman fallen woman the false christian church sitting on seven hills and uh, whoring with politicians rules of this earth and also with paganism so the fact that Ruth left Moab, it is symbolism of us. You know, we clung to God through the woman, through his church, so we can put ourselves right inside her mind because we had to walk away from everything we had known too, brethren, all of our old comfort zones from our own natural way of thinking. Of course, that is our present challenge. Now, it has been repeatedly expressed during the Days of Unleavened Bread we have just gone through. 
that we have to leave the world, we have to leave our preconceived ideas, we have to leave this, leave this world of sin. Now, this, that is a challenge in front of us as well. Now, Ruth's decision to go with Naomi and follow God was the biggest decision of her life, and it is typical of our baptism, brethren. It is typical of coming under the blood of Jesus Christ, who is our Passover. Now, for Ruth to become a physical Israelite, all that she needed to do under the Old Testament as a woman was that she had to immerse herself into mikveh, the ritual bath, and uh, you know offer a sacrifice at the temple, and that was that was the only thing that was required of a Gentile to become Israelite. For males, there was one additional requirement to be circumcised, and that was it. Now, of course, here under the New Covenant, we have Jesus Christ who circumcises our hearts both of males and females and therefore the circumcision is no longer no longer obligation it's not requirement for salvation however as I caution people in the Serbian message there is nothing wrong about circumcision brethren it's a very helpful thing it's not requirement of salvation but if you have male children when they become eight month, uh, eight days old if you have experienced rabbis in your surroundings Jewish community yeah, it's nothing wrong, or perhaps in the hospitals. I know it was once upon a time, it was uh, custom in the hospitals to uh, automatically in, in America to circumcise male children. But if that's not the case anymore, you know, there's nothing wrong about circumcision. You can still do it for the good of your male offspring. It just would save them a lot of troubles in various spheres. And we can talk about it in details at some other time. And please, we'll talk about those things, brethren, without shame. We must not let our offspring be educated about sex matters from this world. We have to overcome shame. We are nothing to be ashamed of. Because shame is going to lead us to suffering and more suffering and our offspring to suffering and more suffering and more mistakes. We have to be very straightforward with them when it comes to certain sex matters. So there are certain advantages in circumcising male children. And yes, we can talk about that later in details when it is the subject. The subject is now the book of Ruth. In any case, we have this challenge before us as we kept the days of unleavened bread. We are reminded of our need to leave Moab, leave the spiritual Egypt. And of course, it is our typ you know, typical of coming under the blood of Jesus Christ, who is our Passover, who was slain for us in uh, we are in verse 18 in the book of Ruth now, chapter 1. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she, Naomi, stopped speaking to her. Now, Naomi wasn't really tired of talking or upset, brethren. It is because Naomi knew this young woman was fully committed. She was not going to change her mind. And there was no need for further discussion because now it was a commitment to who? To the God of Israel. Verse 19, now, the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem which means the house of bread. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them and the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? And yes, brethren, we'll tomorrow get in more details what Naomi really meant. I don't know, I'm not sure if you have uh, the name Mara in your English-speaking world. Strangely enough, we have it. It's one of those old Serbian, we count it Serbian names, but actually, of course, Serbians being ignorant of anything about the Bible, They've, of course, never read the book of Ruth. They've never really, really realized that uh, Mara, Maritza and Mara is actually uh, the Hebrew name. It's actually the name of the house of Israel. And perhaps, I'm just, I'm just speculating as a side point, brethren, perhaps all those people giving their daughter's name Mara, Maritza, they don't, perhaps don't realize they are lost Israelites. <laughs> you never know. In any case, we can very easily sympathize or empathize with Naomi because she's, brethren, so typical of every one of us. Oh no, brethren, none of us lives a fairy tale as members of God's church. However, even though it's not fairy tale, just prior to services, we've heard of several miracles God has performed again. So yes, it's not a fairy tale, but it's not, it's not a tragedy either, you know. But Naomi certainly didn't have a fairy tale life. 
there are times when we also, brethren, wonder, why does God allow the, the trials that I'm going through? Why am I doing this? What does it happen? Why does it happen? Where? You know, what's the purpose of all that? There is always something to learn in a trial, and sometimes it takes time. And sometimes it's hard to step back far enough in our own minds to get the right perspective. And if there is one thing that we all learn throughout trials, rather it's called patience. I'm not sure about you, but I know about myself. I mean, I'm very short when it comes to the virtue of patience. So sometimes we still wonder. And that's how Naomi is. She is not beaten, you know, but she is at a very low point in her life. Verse 22 Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab now, they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley of barley feast. So there we are. Barley, brethren, barley, even to this day, among the Orthodox Jewish community, the ripening of the barley is used to start counting to the days of Pentecost. Remember how we talked during the Feast of, during the feast of Unleavened Bread. We mentioned very clearly that right after the Passover, the first weekly Sabbath, if it happens to be the first day of unleavened bread, then we start counting 50 days from them. If it happens to be within the days of unleavened bread, the very moment when that Sabbath, weekly Sabbath is over, with the sunset, there was this wave shift offering that was being offered to the Lord, that was waved before the eternal. Now, what was the wave shift offering? It was comprised of the first fruits of barley, basically. And even to this day, the observant Jews, you know, are trying to look for barley and ripening of the barley to start counting the new year or counting 50 days and so on and so forth. But they've, they've just made some man-made traditions there and they've just, uh, they've just set the Pentecost on a certain date, you know, 6th of Sivan, which is not always the case. So again, the, you know, the Jewish tradition, brethren, always differs in various ways from what the Bible teaches us. But nevertheless, in the world to come, in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of which will be at the same time the kingdom of Israel, the house of Judah is going to rectify its wrong ways and it's going to finally recognize once for all who their Messiah has been all along. Ruth chapter 2 verse 1, There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz and we'll talk about him in a bit more details tomorrow. So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, of course, it says in English, she happened to come, brethren. It wasn't just a haphazard. It wasn't something that happened by a chance. There was God directing Ruth exactly to go to that field. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So what is, you know, that we see about this young woman? Well, we can right away, I guess, recognize, and you'll remember, it's Proverbs chapter 31, the virtuous woman. So she clings to her aged mother-in-law. She has just barely arrived to the land of Israel, to Judah, which is a foreign country to her. But upon arriving, she has a desire to be productive. She doesn't want to just sit around and wait for things to happen. So she wants to work. Now, this is typical of a Proverbs 31 woman. And I'll remind you that Proverbs 31 is one of those sections in the, in the scriptures written in acrostic. And whatever is in the Bible better written in acrostic, it is a perfect expression of the will of God. You have a few other examples there. Psalm 119 about the law of God, which is perfect for it converts the soul. The whole psalm is written in acrostic. It's a series of acrostics based on the Hebrew alphabet, which has 22 letters. Interestingly enough, there are 22 scrolls of the Old Testament books. For example, all the minor prophets, brethren, are written in a one scroll, so it's counted as one scroll. So 22 scrolls, plus 27 books in the New Testament, part of the scriptures we have 49 7 times 7 perfection times perfection oh no brethren even the canon of the bible was not composed by a chance well it happened to be 49 books oh no certainly not there was god's providence behind it so we see about this woman yes i mentioned psalm 119 also lamentations 
that's another book that we also basically never quote from again you know it's it's coming to my awareness it's not in the book of Ruth it's not in the Song of Solomon it's also the book of Lamentations it's written in acrostic because it was a perfect destruction of the land of Judah and the city of Jerusalem as God prophesied through his prophet Jeremiah so that's another example of acrostic there are other examples but you know every time you see acrostics brethren that's the perfectly expressed will of God so a woman you know of a Proverbs 31 woman a woman who is being led and guided by the power of God and it is typical of first love you know when we first come into the church of God and we learn these new things and this is what you know Ruth had you know it is very typical of a truly converted person brother she wants to go out to work to do something in Leviticus chapter 19 I want to give you and remind you of the instruction regarding gleaning grain this was very unique it was a hard work by the way Leviticus 19 and 9 when you reap the harvests of your land you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest and you shall not glean your vineyard nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard and shall you shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger i am the lord your god and before i proceed about the ruth the book of ruth let me just tell you brethren that this law in leviticus 19 does apply to us in spirit <coughs> what do i mean well uh, in america you have these tips kind of being inculculating in, into the bills which i found ludicrous by the way and total totally out of mind give more than that brethren when you have to pay for something give more don't glean in other words don't be stingy brethren there is nothing i guess one of the most horrendous characteristics of any person on the face of the earth is stinginess and sadly to say to you good portion of the modern house of israel is known for its stinginess and yes i'll be very specific english people dutch people and the jewish people they're known for their stinginess and on top of everything else jewish people are known for always kind of complaining about something always wanting something always kind of behaving as if they're victims of you know wrong service mistreatment whatever brethren that is awful thing it's awful to keep complaining about everything we're to be grateful and being stingy it's also awful brethren there is one I'm not sure how it is rendered in English but there is a, 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 a there is a proverb which I'm sure you'll recognize but in Serbian it says it says he opened up he he let it go loose and it was a blessing to that person and he gained more the more you open those who open their hands it says God will give them more and more to those who keep their fists clenched and not give give away they will you know they will have less and less brethren don't be stingy please please that's the spirit of God is still this one in particular does apply to us in spirit don't be brethren stingy when it comes to money give more I don't think that you should be now financing all kind of poor people out there because we never really know who is genuinely poor or not but if you know there's somebody who is genuine do it in secret you know do good in secret but when you're paying for something or when you're just don't be stingy give brethren more don't glean if there is something that just has fallen that can somebody can have use of even birds of the field don't glean from the fields don't be you know don't be like that be generous one of the most generous culture that I know of is the American culture. So that's something that I often point out to my people here and others as well. Generosity is something that God requires of us as Christ followers. American culture in generous is very well known for its generosity. And I'm sure that that's actually the remnant of that Israelitish nature in them, which is excellent example for the rest of the world. But again, as I said, and I was very specific, good portions of the modern house of israel brethren are known for their stinginess we as followers of christ again have this law apply in us in spiritual sense don't be stingy now this gleaning of the fields if you have a field of course or a farm i'm sure that those of you who are farm owners certainly follow this law not to glean everything now this was an israelitish custom this is what God had commanded, brethren. The grain that fell from the hands of the tools during harvest was not to be picked up. A law. What a unique and amazing law. 
Now they were, you know, they were, the reapers were to let it lay for the needy or for the strangers. Additionally, the harvesters were to leave parts of the corners left standing for them so that they knew they had a place they could go and get something for of sustenance. Now for Ruth or for anyone who went to glean grain, it meant working bent over hours at a time. Gleaning, brethren, little bits here and little bits there, moving along, looking, searching, picking up. It wasn't an easy work at all. Now the parallel to the days of unleavened bread comes to mind because after Passover, we go to work gleaning what? Well, remember the Apostle Paul wrote in Corinthians that we are not to celebrate the Passover and the feast in the old bread of insincerity and, uh, and untruths. We are to live you know, with the new bread of sincerity and truth. So we glean. What do we glean, brethren? We glean sincerity and truth and we feed on it because that is the thing we want to take on, what we want to become. No, it comes a little bit at a time, and we have to work at it, or it won't happen, brethren. Spiritual life, Christ, Christ-like life, does take some efforts. And sure enough, if you don't work, it won't happen. And so Ruth is working. This lady, brethren, is dedicated. Now, from Exodus chapter 23 and verse 16, we know that there were two harvests in the land. Even to this day, the same is true of the promised land. The same is true here in our country, Serbia. We basically have the two harvest seasons, the spring and the autumn one. So we fully understand and we better understand that those of us who live in the countries with that kind of, uh, with that kind of harvest time, we do understand God's plan much better. Why did he give this plan? I think for countries like Guatemala, where you have 25 degrees Celsius all years along, eternal spring, or Kenya with the same kind of, uh, uh, climate, I guess it might be a bit difficult to understand that but for us it is not so there was an early small harvest and then a large harvest in the fall, now Naomi and Ruth got to Bethlehem as we have read at the beginning of the early harvest before the feast of first fruits it's also very significant that Ruth brethren chose to go and glean in a particular field because in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 2 back in there we read that uh, she wanted to glean his field where she might find favor. The word favor is often translated grace. So Ruth wanted to be able to go to a place where she could find grace. Now, there were lots of fields around Jerusalem. Bethlehem is not far away from Jerusalem. There were lots of fields, you know, to go and glean. But, you know, she chose to work only in the field where she would find grace. And again, we are brethren looking at a very positive story about ourselves because we are presently working in the very same field. We could have chosen to glean anywhere, but we only sought the field where grace was. It is God's field. It is God's church. Ruth typifies for us the first fruits of whom we hope to be a part. That's why tomorrow... At the Feast of the First Fruits, we're going to read the entire book of Ruth and we're going to see again, we're going to glean more knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of God, brethren, from that book. Now, Boaz, Ruth chapter 2, verse 4, is also a type of someone. Ruth 2, 4. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. Oh, brethren, if we had bosses like this. You know, Boaz was a boss. He comes to see his field and he's the Lord be with you. What does that tell us about the man right away? He's obviously godly man, dedicated man. Keep in mind, brethren, this was a time of judges when everybody was doing what was right in his or her own eyes. Very little, very few people followed God and maintained the true knowledge of God and based their decisions on the knowledge of God. Like did Naomi, like did obviously Boaz, and like did Ruth. And they answer him, the Lord bless you. How would the world would be different if the you know, employers, employees would say to their bosses, the Lord bless you. And the you know, employer would say, the Lord be with you. But brethren, this is not the case in the world. But let me tell you now for the record, very publicly. We ought to be very ashamed that this kind of relations, working relations were, were rarely, if ever, struck between church members. We ought to be very ashamed, brethren. We worked for the people out in the world. We made this world very rich in the 20th century. 
but it rarely came to our minds that we should band together on various levels, create our own little, perhaps, companies, create our own working relationships, brethren. It's shame. It's a deep shame, I would say. Something that we also need to repent of, indeed. Instead of opening up our homes and joining all the little strength we have, we're paying, you know, renting holes out there, making whole owners rich. We, we have just enriched this world tremendously. Meanwhile, we could have directed that money internally to all of us within the church, church of God and, and basically make all of us progress. That wasn't the case. Thankfully, in the continued church of God, I'm so glad to say, not one dime, not one dinar was ever given for renting halls. And we are blessed, brethren, because of that. We are not making this world rich anymore. And to tell you something that might be, might, perhaps it's not a secret, but let me tell you this one, how the attitude needs to be. I'm going to use the overseer, Dr. Bob Thiel, for this. He wanted to register, and he still does want to register his own company here in our country, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, in order to make our conditions, church member conditions here, better. That's what he told me. He's been trying to register his country here for, uh, his company here for months and years now. Perhaps he will not succeed, but his attitude is right, brethren. That is how we should be thinking as peop God, peop people of God. Yes, we are due to go, do good to all men. We do that, but we are to stop finally wasting our money. Sorry to say this. Wasting so much of our money on the world outside. And we are to use all the opportunities we have to help one another, better one another. And keep that money within us. And use the little resources we all have in whatever capacity we can have for the progress of the people of God. So anyway, here comes Boaz. He's coming from town and he's going out, you know, to the field. And instead of saying, how much have you guys gotten done all day? How many acres have you covered? Which a typical boss would do. Boaz, what does he say? He says, the Lord be with you. If you're a boss in any capacity, that's how you're supposed to be. Of course, you're not supposed to allow your employers to take advantage of you and, 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 and steal money and stuff that we have heard sadly from Mrs. Steele. She reported that she can never find, she can always never find, almost never find caregiver for her, for their son, David. And those of you who are on the forum, you've read my message. I said, perhaps the answer is we're looking in the wrong, in the wrong field. Because it seems that only one she can employ to work around the house would be a converted person. So I said, let's pray for a converted person to show up to be employed so that the Thiels could have enough space and time and energy to raise up their David, their son, with, who has some special needs. And uh, he's now a grown up, you know, big lad. So there is a caregiver that needs to come. But Mrs. Steele just, you know, lamented. She says, I never seem to have luck with these, with these employ employees. They always, they only don't, they don't show up for interviews or they come up and leave very quickly. And, and then I find damaged marble in the kitchen. I find money being stolen, alcohol being stolen from the house, brethren. That's the world in which we are living. The world with decreasing knowledge of God, brethren. So I'm praying and I hope you'll be praying as well. We all should be praying for a miracle for a converted person to shop out of somewhere and become employed, have a steady employment with the Thiels. And that will be a blessing to the Thiel family. It will be a blessing to that person, brethren. That's how we are supposed to be thinking. At least that's my conviction. If you have any better idea, let me know. But I, as far from, my, for, from what I could have seen on the forum, all of you have immediately agreed with me yes a converted person is needed so let's pray for a converted person so here is Boaz he's not asking how many acres have been harvested he says the Lord be with you now brethren what kind of an effect that did have on these people that were working for him 
Well, we read, we read, we read it. The Lord bless you. That was the effect. A good relationship. A great lesson here in the power of a godly mind and godly communication. Rather, in the power that he has on others around us. Now, Boaz had a very positive and sincere approach to those he came in contact with. And obviously, that made an impression on Ruth as well. No wonder that later she was willing to do a very strange custom. <laughs> We're going to read about that tomorrow. We'll read about that even today, but tomorrow we're going to read it again. A strange custom to uncover men's feet and lay at his feet, brethren. That was a strange custom. But there is a reason for that. We'll elaborate on that tomorrow. There was a symbolism of that. In ancient Israel, covering somebody or taking somebody under his wing was marriage proposal, brethren. Which was advised to her by her mother-in-law, Naomi. So again, even the advice was based on what? On the knowledge of God, brethren. The lady, Naomi, obviously knew the Old Testament through and through. Verse 5. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So we see that Boaz, brethren, was a typical type of who? Of God, of Jesus Christ, who is also God. He was a very caring, concerned person. You see, he wanted to know now who this new person was out in the field. Now, he tells us that he was undoubtedly always aware of who was coming and who was going in his fields. Now, we know that there is a type of that too, because God already knows when a sparrow falls. He knows how many heirs we have on our head. So, we see that Boaz himself was very, very concerned about anybody that came under his care. And then in verse 6, he gets the, he gets the, uh, the answer to that question. Who is that? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered his, and he said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Obviously, Boaz, first of all, he knows that these are his relatives, number one. And number two, Boaz obviously recognizes a hard-working woman. So he says, young woman, so Boaz said, and of course, by that time, the whole of Bethlehem was speaking about this tremendous event which happened. Here comes Naomi. She's empty-handed. She has got no great wealth. She has got nothing, but only one thing, her daughter-in-law with her. Her daughter-in-law, who is a Moabite, a stranger, a lady of a totally different culture. And then Boaz, verse 8, said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And of course, there is significance in this, brethren. Young men not to touch you. In these days of judges, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. Meaning, brethren, the knowledge of God slipped away from minds of many physical Israelites. So therefore, you can well understand why... Boaz commanded the young man not to touch Ruth. And when you are thirsty, verse 9 continues, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. In other words, you don't even have to bring your own water. Verse 10, and by the way, there are 10 little kindnesses of Boaz to Ruth. We'll talk about it tomorrow. And I shall remind you again, we mentioned that number 10, according to the Bible, Bible numerology, Number 10 is a symbolism of divine order. So Ruth didn't happen just to, you know, run into the field of Boaz and then start gleaning there. Obviously, it was God leading her to that very field. And then verse 10, So she fell on her face, bowed, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor, or why have I found grace in your eyes, that thou shalt take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? She wonders, why is this? Now, Boaz had intervened for her. He had given her guidance. He had made a place for her among his young women. He had given her favor, just as God, brethren, has given us grace or favor. Now, we might ask why, just as Ruth did. Because, you know, we were all spiritual foreigners at one time before God's favor, the favor of our calling, the opening of our minds. And verse 11, well, now we see why. And Boaz answered to, and said to her, He has been fully reported to me, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth 
and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Well, again, a type of us. I'll mention that tomorrow, brethren, but let's use the uh, the uh, newest example of that. When, when the two now baptism candidates came among us, did they know any of us? Perhaps they knew only our deacon Richard but, Richard, but other than him, they didn't know about any of us. You see, so Ruth is again a type of the Church of God, brethren. That's what we are. We are part of the Church of God. We are part of those first fruits. The Church of God is, a, is not just another church out there. The Church of God is the church of the first fruits of those who are now being trained by the Eternal to be kings and priests in the Kingdom of God, brethren. As I explained to you in the message, why the church? Why the only true church of God? No, we are not like an, uh, just another church out there. Oh yeah, we've got so many of those churches, we're just one of those churches. No, we are not, brethren. We are not because those people, those church goers out there, they have got no idea what's the purpose of the church. They just, they just go you know, every Sunday to their services just to feel good about themselves and come back home comforted in their own sins. Because nobody preaches to them repentance. Nobody tells them that God is going to bring them to judgment. Nobody quotes to them about the punishment coming to their lands. To the point that there will be even cannibalism in their lands. Nobody preaches those things, brethren. But yes, we as the Church of God do preach the full counsel of God. And even the most unpleasant things that people don't like to listen, brethren, I keep preaching them all the time. Because they're part of the inspired word of God. Even those things that people will shun away from when it comes to sex matters, which I mentioned, which I mentioned, we must not, brethren, for the sake of our young people. We must not let them fall into Satan's clutches, brethren, because we will be equally responsible before God. And in the judgment, God is going to ask us, why didn't you teach your youth what you should what you were supposed to teach them? And if there are those of you who are parents and are feel, feel kind of uneasy about that, fine. There are the rest of us who are able to overcome shyness and shame. And yes, we will just jump in and we will instruct our youth. Brethren, we must do everything we can to defend our young people from the clutches of Satan. And if you think that Satan doesn't want to grab them into his clutches, you're so wrong, brethren. He can barely wait for that to mess up with their nature, to use their misinformation or the lack of information. And why you may wonder, why am I so strong about this? Well, brethren, because when I was newly converted, nobody was there to tell me some things. And I thought that some things that were happening to me were sin, when in fact they were not sin. And that messed up my spiritual life as well that's how serious it is that's why we have to instruct our children about sexual matters like for example let me be very specific that nocturnal emissions is nothing sinful it's a mechanism which god instilled in males for their own good but there was nobody to tell me that very back then and when it happened to me i thought i committed grave sin and i was terribly repentant i was just I, I determined never again to let myself experience something like that. And what an agony I have, you know, I have incurred upon myself. What an agony and what a suffering. Unnecessarily, brethren. Why is that? Well, because I was in England when there's some, you know, it's a shame to speak about some things, really. If God is not ashamed to speak about, about them, we have no reason to be ashamed to speak of So, again, proper instructions, brethren, based on the knowledge of God. It is our obligation to tell the young people. As clear as that. Because otherwise, I repeat, we shall be held responsible in the judgment. So finally, as I said, Boaz gives this grace to Ruth. He tells her why. Verse 12, the Lord repay your work, Boaz says, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel. He's saying this to a, man, a woman from Moab. In other words, Boaz was saying, God is going to bless you because of what you're doing, because of your relationship with Him. 
under whose wings Boaz says you have come for refuge. So unbeknown, un <laughs> that's that funny word which I can spell, but I can really say it in your English. Un unbeknownst to Ruth, Boaz had kept himself fully informed of his newly returned relatives. He knew what was going on in their lives. He knew of her love and her service to her mother-in-law. He also knew that she had broken brethren with her past and he knew of her trust in God. What we see is that Ruth had her priorities right. Now Christ says, I'll remind you, that's in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So Ruth obviously was serving only one master. She was serving God and she was acting on the knowledge that she had of him. So, brethren, she could have chosen a completely different course. She was a young woman. I'm, I bet she was a, she was a very, a very, you know, very good-looking young woman. She could have chosen somebody young, somebody rich, as so many young girls do today. So we have been reminded of that also during the recent days of unleavened bread. Brethren, Ruth could have reasoned in her own mind and said, well, now this is the solution that I need. So she could have chosen a rich young man who would not perpetuate her dead husband's name and thus she could have chosen someone who would not have had any real concern for Naomi. Why should we have you know, any concern for an old woman? But you see, Ruth's decisions are based on the knowledge of God the knowledge of the God of Israel. And Christ goes on then in later in verse 31 to talk about warring. He says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. In other words, those who don't have the God of Israel, they worry. For a heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now Ruth was a Gentile by birth, as you know, but she had a very different method of dealing with needs. Now, God had begun working with her mind, obviously, back in Moab, possibly through her husband, Mahlon, but certainly through her mother-in-law, Naomi. So she has chosen to live her life trusting God to provide for her needs. Now, God's involvement in her life speaks for itself as we read the story about her. There was somebody else also who was a Gentile by birth. It was Cornelius. As Peter spoke when he went to Cornelius' house, which was unheard of for a Jewish man to do, he spoke about God's involvement with the lives in the lives of Gentiles. That's in Acts, I'll read there, chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Indeed, brethren. And I'll add to that the great mystery that Paul explains in Romans. Everyone who fears him and works righteousness becomes spirit-led Israelite. They all become Israelites. Nothing to be ashamed of because God who is revealed to us in the Bible is, as we have been reading in the book of Ruth, God of Israel. So Peter, you see, once the staunch Jewish believer, he came to understand through the vision that he had prior, you know, prior to seeing Cornelius, that the church was not to be a respecter of persons because God is not. God accepts all who fear Him and all who seek to do His will, and He freely gives His Spirit to those who repent and come to Him. That's why He sent seven witnesses of Jewish origin to the house of Cornelius to see that exactly the same Spirit was poured out upon them that was poured out on the day of Pentecost, which we are celebrating tomorrow. Now, Ruth's life, again, is a mirror of our own life, in that God, brethren, through His Spirit, freely gives us the power to accomplish needy tasks that are beyond us. Because there are many tasks that are beyond us that God gives us power to accomplish. Now Boaz, who serves as a physical type of God, made a way to meet Ruth's needs, as well as Naomi's actually. Ruth chapter 2 verse 15. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Now this was a huge advantage, because a person was not to glean until the sheaves were all bound, brethren. And everything was done. And then they could go in and the uh, shocks, you know, would be, you know, would be set up. The shocks would be set up. But she was allowed to get in early. Verse 16, also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out 
what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. I think ephah was about a gallon of barley, which back in those days was enough to feed her and Naomi at least for a week, brethren. So these are blessings that she could not have achieved for herself. As we commented this afternoon in Serbian, we always need a hand, a helpful hand to lead us and drag us somewhere or you know, give us somebody to give us a hand before we achieve some great success. Ruth couldn't have achieved all this by herself. She couldn't have gained this for herself. She had gleaned enough here in one day for perhaps, who knows, maybe several weeks for herself and her mother-in-law. And it was just one day of gleaning, so there were weeks to come. Because remember, it was seven weeks to the day of the first fruits, the day of Pentecost. So this reminds us of how graciously God fills our needs through the power of His Spirit, though the blessings He gives us, through the blessings that is that He gives us in our life. Now we don't see actually, or we don't read in the book of Ruth, that Ruth was specifically asking for the needs of her and the needs of her mother-in-law. We don't see that she specifically asked you know, for that needs to be met exactly as Boaz provided, but that was done, and it was done, and we see how it works. Because I'll remind you again of Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 29. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, because we all have weaknesses, brethren. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who, or in which, searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He makes the intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, brethren, we don't always know how to pray as we ought to. As a matter of fact, we rarely know how to pray as we ought to. Christ in one place says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, I'll do. So if we ask in according to the Father's will, it will be done. So what, that, what you know, that tells us is a lot of times we don't really know how to pray as we ought. We don't know what God's will is in a particular matter. Because ours is a walk of faith. We don't really walk by sight. We don't see every twist or every turn in that road that lies ahead of us in our lives. And when we get into a twist or turn, we just, you know, may not know why we are in this twist. Why am I having this trial? We may not know exactly which way to go. We can, and often we do feel like Naomi did after so many successive trials. She felt like her name should be Mara. Now that is, you know, that should be bitterness instead of pleasantness. So she wasn't by any means rejecting God, but as Paul wrote here, she was rather weakened. So we can relate to this. Sometimes we simply don't know what to pray for in order to be in accordance with God's will. Sometimes during there are some, you know, some things, some trials, we even go to our knees. We just say Father and then blank. We don't know what to continue to pray for. Did it ever happen to you? Well, I'm sure it did, brethren. It happened to me. But again, the Spirit knows and it makes intercessions for us. It is a remarkable blessing. So God's Spirit knows what is in our minds because it lives there. And when we receive His Spirit at baptism, brethren, it lives there and it makes intercession for the needs that we have because we don't know often how to ask. If it is a need for more of a particular fruit in our lives, it will you know, make utterance for us according to what it sees. And very likely it will be against our own will for a period of time until we come to comprehend it. So brethren, our will generally, well, I'm sure you know that, our will generally is very different than what God's will, you know, is for us initially. Maybe we don't really see that we really do need patience. I mentioned patience or humility because we take often things for granted or self-control or whatever the case may be. But whatever the Spirit knows we need, that is where it intercedes for us. That brings us back now to the concept of work. Better actively going in search of sincerity and truth, which is what the Holy Spirit knows we need. It knows we need sincerity and truth if we want to grow, if we want to develop, if we want to excel in our spiritual lives, we need sincerity and truth. Now Ruth had to first work at gleaning and then her needs were supplied above measure. She had to go to work, she had to take that step, she had to put out herself out there and then the blessings came. 
Some of us here in this country, brethren, those who are employed, cannot be employed because of the Sabbath issue other than working in the third, or that is in your English-speaking world, night shift. Day in and day out. And they're enduring that very well. I've never heard them complain about that, brethren. Why? Because based on the knowledge of God, they keep the Sabbath and they put God first. Those who are employed, there are two, one member and one prospective member, they always work the night shifts. That's the only way that they can keep the Sabbath. Because the freedom of religion is not guaranteed. Yes, it is on the paper by the Constitution. But keeping of the Sabbath as part of the freedom of religion is not guaranteed in the Constitution of this country. But nevertheless, based on the knowledge of God, those people who work the night shift, they understand why they do it, and I've never heard them complain about it. Which is a true and great example of faith indeed. There are other people who are carnal around them saying, why do you work third shift all the night shift all the time? How can you endure? They wonder, brethren, they're not, they, they, they don't understand. But we know of all people why and why they can endure and why. Because God gives them blessings, you see. That they can endure because they're willing to go out and do that and, 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 and kind of sacrifice for his own sake. So anyway, the Ruth's needs, you know, were satisfied above measure. But little by little, brethren, it came. It was little by little, bit by bit. In the same way, the Holy Spirit leads us into the truth that we need most. And it will bring us through any twist or any turn that we encounter on our road as we go forward, that is, toward our destination. Verse 28. Notice I avoided the word destiny because it's a pagan concept. Destination. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good, good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now, we know, brethren, by faith that it is true. We cannot always, however, see it right away that we can have full confidence of it regardless. We have no idea why somebody had allergic reaction this evening or this morning. What was the purpose of that? We have no idea. We'll certainly, I'm sure, see it, you know, in the long run. Now, this is the thing we saw in Ruth. She had confidence that God would be her God and take her under his wing, just as he said. So we see very encouraging parallels between Ruth, Naomi, and ourselves. Ruth chapter 2 verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? Because she obviously realized that this amount of barley, she couldn't just gain herself on her own strength. And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said that the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi knew what gleaning was like, brethren. She knew how much grain you could expect after a hard day of gleaning, and she could see, you know, this was a regular day of days worth of gleaning. So something had happened here. She may have been down for a while, but she recognized a blessing when she saw it. Verse 20. Then Naomi said to her daughter in law, Blessed be the be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said to her, this man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives, Ruth the Moabite. Now Ruth, obviously, I guess she was already by now. She liked, she liked Boaz and his kindness, so she adds a little bit oil into the fire. And Ruth the Moabite said, he also said to me, you shall stay close by my young man until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to, to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field because you never know who might be in any other field. Obviously, she knew who was Boaz. She knew he was a godly person and she realized that Ruth was very safe there. And she realized something else. Based on what? Based on the knowledge of God. If there was no brother, the nearest kinsman was the one who was to be Redeemer, just like Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, brethren. Verse 23, so she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to clean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Now all the time the mother-in-law keeps waiting, obviously, for the end of the harvest. Now Naomi at this stage, brethren, no doubt, Naomi is continuing in the very same fashion with Ruth that she had while living with her in Moab. She is giving her wise counsel, and again, 
It is based on God's word. It is based on the knowledge of God. It is not based on her own reasoning. And there is another parallel before we go to chapter 3. Her role with Ruth is a type of the church's role with us. Naomi introduced Ruth to God and thereby to Boaz. We also see that Ruth was careful to follow the counsel she had been given. So she applied the knowledge of God. Her mother had led her to our Heavenly Father. Again, we see these parallels, brethren. We understand them in our own lives today. That's why <coughs> the book of Ruth, even the Jewish people don't understand why they read it. On the day of Pentecost is being read even among them on the day of Pentecost. That's why tomorrow we are going to read again the book of Ruth in its entirety and glean out the most we can. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, Okay, the bring the harvest is now end, ended, has ended. My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Oh, she has got something in mind, obviously. But again, it's all based on the law of God, brethren. It's nothing of her own reasoning. So she's continuing to guide this young woman in a particular way. What she's about to tell her could have raised questions in Ruth's mind because, you know. <laughs> Verse 2. Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, he is he not our relative. In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now Naomi has got her eye on a potential kinsman redeemer, brethren. That is what we read in, about in Deuteronomy chapter 25. We shall read about that tomorrow. Because it extends beyond immediate brothers to the nearest kin, as I said. And Boaz could be a kinsman redeemer. So he could potentially take Ruth for his wife in order to raise up a child who could then carry on the family name of Mahlon and have the inheritance then of her dead husband. So verse 3, now comes this strange advice which... You young ladies in this day and age will find very strange, but in, back in Israel in those days, it was a custom. Verse 3, Therefore wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So basically, you know, the advice is, Ruth, sneak into the threshing floor. <laughs> Verse 4, Then it shall be, when he lies down, now it gets worse, that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. Now, this could certainly raise concerns in Ruth's mind, brethren. But however, Naomi advises her on how to prepare to do this particular thing, to present herself as a lovely and a virtuous woman that she has become. So she is to put on her very best garment, and that is typical, brethren, of something else. Well, you certainly know the truth is a type of the bride of Christ by now. And in Revelation chapter 19, it says in verse 7 and 8, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife, of which Ruth is a type of, has made herself ready. And to her it was grant, granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen, fine linen, is the righteous acts of the saints. And Ruth was obviously a virtuous and righteous woman. So our Father, brethren, is preparing each one of us in the very same way as Ruth was being prepared to go and meet Boaz. We are being prepared for the coming marriage to Christ as the first fruits. That's why, because of this story, we're going to be reminded of that particular aspect of the meaning of the day of the first fruits tomorrow by reading the book of Ruth. We are going to be dressed in our very best garments at that time as well. Ruth chapter 3 verse 5. Now Ruth's attitude to her mother's law instruction illustrates her level of spiritual maturity. Brethren, the level of maturity which I hope and pray and hope and hope and hope that all of us will come to that same level of spiritual maturity. What I particularly allude to is that sometimes some doctrines of the Bible, not doctrines of the church, notice because the church... The continuing church of God preaches what the Bible teaches. I, 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 I hope that some doctrines of the Bible, even though they may not make sense to us, that we will nevertheless follow them, accept them, embrace them, and believe them because it is written in the Bible. Yes, I'm sure that the doctrine of Trinity or Unitarianism, brethren, does make sense to the world outside, but it is neither of those is the doctrine of the Bible. 
God is a family, one family into which innumerable members can be born into. It doesn't make any sense, probably. But when you think more about that, it does make perfect sense, because God created family units. Family units in which you have females, representatives of the church, males, representatives of Christ, and then, in some cases, offsprings, however numerous they might be. In all family units, you can have countless number of children be born. They all have one family name. So does God. He has family name God, Elohim. Yahweh, however you want to call him, it's all his names. He has one family God, his God family. Just like in all our physical families, so even so in God family, countless number of people can be born. So it does make sense. At first it may not make sense, but give it some thought that it does. So I hope that we'll reach this level of spiritual maturity. Ruth perhaps didn't know about this custom because it was, again, Israelitish custom. But she was spiritually mature, brethren. We see that Ruth 3 verse 5, and she said to her, to her mother-in-law, All that you say to me, I will do. So brethren, Ruth was very confident in what her mother-in-law had told her, that she would never advise her contrary to God's truth or contrary to virtue. That's the same confidence we should have in the Church of God as our mother, spiritual mother. Now what Naomi had told her may have sounded a little bit bold, Sneak in, you know, secretly. Can you imagine a young woman by night sneaking in secretly to the threshing floor? To uncover somebody's feet and lay at somebody's feet. I mean, how, how ludicrous, strange, twisted that sounds. It might have been an uncomfortable thing to do initially, but, you know, this is a spiritually mature young woman who is humble-minded. Her attitude is typical of each one of us, brethren, when we respond to godly instruction just in the same way that she did. But it is also typical of someone who would descend from her some 1,100 years later. Very typical of Jesus Christ who came through her line, brethren. And you'll see tomorrow why it is important. Because there was one kinsman who was nearer, nearer than Boaz. And his name is not even mentioned in this book. You may wonder why. Well, there is a good reason for that. We'll talk about that tomorrow. In Matthew 6, I'll remind you that Jesus Christ taught his disciples to think and to pray daily, your kingdom come, your will be done. And even in the face of death, we know what, is, what did Jesus Christ say? Not my will, but your will be done. Because brethren, Christ always responded to the Father's instruction. That's what we see Ruth doing here. She's responding to God's instruction. Ruth had to make a choice. I'll remind you also of 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, about making choice. Was Ruth going to do this thing or was she not? So submitting to godly instruction is a choice, brethren, for every one of us, including King Saul. As you know, he was dethroned and another dynasty came to rule, the dynasty of David. Whose, one of her, his uh, ancestors was... Who else but the righteous woman Ruth? Amazing, brethren. But King Saul, the first king of Israel, 1 Samuel 15, 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt, burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft... So those of you doubters who might be around here, doubting the doctrines of the Bible and doubting the ministry of the church, beware. Because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king, brethren. When we look at Saul's example, we see just how serious the other choice is. Why? Because Saul, as you remember, lost humble view that he had had of himself in the past and became proud. Proud enough to reject God's instruction, very clear instruction to him. And it was met with the rejection of him being king of Israel because simple obedience, brethren, yes, I know it isn't easy, goes against our nature. It isn't easy, particularly when pride comes into the play. So Saul needed to have the habit that we can assume that Ruth had. 
that of praying for God's will and praying for God's guidance and discernment to recognize and understand it. She no doubt did as you or I have to do, ask for help in accepting God's simple instructions which he teaches us through his church, brethren. And we receive instructions, we can read them for ourselves and God gives us very simple instruction. So we need to remember that you know, the beautiful and refreshing example that Ruth set didn't happen just because she recognized the God of Israel. Yes, she did recognize the God of Israel. She had to, but it is also because she was a willing overcomer. She was a committed doer. Remember what I said in the message about why the church is not in our brethren to have the Spirit? We have to be led by the Spirit. In other words, those who don't do anything with the Spirit and with the gifts given by the Spirit, at the end they'll lose it, even the Spirit which they have. Work is, brethren, needed in our lives. Ruth was overcomer, committed to her. She had to work at preparing to be a bride, just as we have to. She went in search of the grain. We have to go in search of sincerity and truth. Wherever it can be found, we have to glean it, brethren. Ruth chapter 3 and verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. Just stop and imagine. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, obviously the harvest was plentiful, great, and he was a righteous man, he was grateful for what God has given him, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled. I mean, who wouldn't be startled? <laughs> he wakes up in the middle of the night and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. Well, wouldn't any of us be startled? And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Brethren, there was nothing immodest about what Ruth did here, because she lay at his feet. She didn't lay beside him. She uncovered his feet. And now, because he was a near kinsman, she basically asked that he spread his cover over her, which was simply a symbol of his intention to take her as his wife. And we shall spend some time tomorrow a little bit on, the, on this custom. And I'm sure you know, you remember, that that's how God described his relationship to Israel. When you were young, he said, I sprang my wing to cover your nakedness. That's better when Israel came, out of the came into the wilderness out of Egypt. God proposed that marriage. And when was that marriage... Uh, when was that marriage made or uh, was the word where was that marriage uh, when did it come into force on the day of pentecost at mount sinai that's another meaning of that's again the meaning of that day tomorrow again i'm reminding you now of those aspects you'll hear in other messages but we'll focus tomorrow on one aspect in particular bride ruth being type of the bride to be prepared for the, as the first fruit she was of Gentile origin, that's what is also important, but she had to become Israelite. Boaz being the symbol of Jesus Christ, the marriage of the Lamb, brethren. That's what we are being prepared for now. Verse 10, Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. Well, at the beginning, brethren, refers to how she loved her husband in life and in death. She also loved her mother-in-law, and she had continually been serving her mother-in-law. But the love that she is showing now exceeded all of the rest, because she was desirous, according to God's law, to build up her husband's family name. This was, brethren, again, based on what? On the knowledge of God. And that's what she was basing her decision on. Now, by marrying the near kinsman, no matter his age, and some Jewish commentators say we don't necessarily have to believe them, but they said that he was about 80 years old. Again, those are Jewish commentators, we don't have to believe them, but obviously he was older than her because she didn't look after young and rich men. By marrying the near kinsman, even though he was many years her senior, in order to raise up seed to the name and the memory of her deceased husband rather than forgetting him and going on after young men brethren this is an exceptional example she was a very loving person and she was very content with god's will in her life are we 
and Ruth was acting on what she knew. Are we? There are things we don't really know. Why certain trials, this, that, and the other? Some things we don't understand now, but how are we? So Ruth didn't just hear it. Verse 11, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I'll do for you all that you request for. All the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. She had a spotless reputation. I'll brethren remind you again, James chapter 1, verse 27. James says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Ruth was unspotted from the world. She had certainly fulfilled this description. She was a widow herself, and yet she was taking care of a widow, her mother-in-law. A woman, a tender woman. She had kept herself unspotted. She had the right, the highest moral standards. Now, the things about Boaz was he knew there was a kinsman redeemer closer than him, so he had to try to solve this dilemma. Chapter 4 of Ruth, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, a close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Come aside, friend, and sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took them, took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants of the elders of my and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I'll redeem it. Do you notice there is no name of this man recorded in the Bible, brethren? And there is a good reason for that. You will certainly realize. Selfishness. Verse 5, then Boaz said, Oh, on the day that you buy the field from the land, from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. I'm sure you don't really understand quite what this says, but we'll spend some time about it tomorrow. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. I'll explain this to you tomorrow. So, brethren, the nearer kinsman was anxious to do... You know, to do it all up to the moment that he realized, basically, that there was to be a wife and then a child. And then the inheritance would go to the child. And there was, by the, by the way, Naomi to take care of. So there was no advantage for him there, brother. That's why he gave up. But Boaz wasn't looking for advantage. He was a type of Christ. So what he did had nothing to do with selfish gain, brethren. He was a compassionate man. He was a keeper of the law. He became her kinsman redeemer, not because he had to, but because it was the right thing to do. Again, the choice. Boaz chose based on the knowledge of God, the right thing to do. And it gave Ruth a potential child and it gave Naomi a future. It was a tremendous blessing. And this is a perfect parallel to what we have been given. Let us, in closing, go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17. And 18. And if you can call, you call on the Father, verse 17, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Brethren, like Ruth, we are to live our lives not like the world around us. In other words, not to live our life like the old man or like the old person. Not to do that, brethren. We are not to do what seems right in our own eyes, where we make our own choices, solve our own problems. Leave our children up to the world to educate them under quotation mark about important matters of sexual life and sexual morality, brethren. We are rather in, to be in fear of and in knowledge of God. Verse 18, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of lamb without blemish and without spot. Boaz was a typical, he was a physical type of our perfect kinsman redeemer. Christ, brethren, as we know, bought us back very willingly, not because we were spiritual Gentiles, but he bought us back because of the potential for the family of God as part of the bride of Christ. Let's return now, finally, at the conclusion of the story of the book of Ruth. 
chapter 4 verse 13 chapter 4 verse 13 in the book of Ruth so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and when he went into her the Lord gave the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son so it is God brethren who determines and, and, and does according to his will that there will be children or not then the women said to Naomi blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel <laughs> and his name of course became famous in Israel because he was the ancestor of King David verse 15 and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you who is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Now this child, brethren, was Obed, the child who eventually became the grandfather of King David, through whose line Jesus Christ would be born. So it is an incredible story. It is not a fairy tale. This is all reality, brethren, so positive, so tremendous. So in closing, let us draw our attention back to Naomi, who is a type of the church. She, brethren, went through many great trials in the span of her lifetime. And so also has the church since 31 AD, when the Holy Spirit was given to the church. The church has gone through a vast array of good times and trials. There was rapid growth, there was unity, there was prosperity, there were miracles, there were difficult times. There was persecution, there was violence, there was death. There were more miracles. The church has seen everything in between as we have today. We have all felt down like Naomi did for a while. And we have all felt elation at different times in the history of the church in our lifetime. But you see, the constant factor in Naomi's life, brethren, was as well as the life of the church was faith. And is faith, it has been faith. By faith, we know all things will eventually work to, good, to the good. When I say faith, again, it is faith based on the knowledge of God. We believe what we know God says. We know that God says the gates of, the, of hell will, not, will never prevail against the church. We know that God's plan of salvation will fully unfold in due course. And we know that there will be great rejoicing in the end. There will never be sorrow tears suffering anymore brethren it is all based on what it is not based on our own reasoning but on the knowledge of god so let us follow ruth's example and let us be brethren fully committed working to glean sincerity and truth each and every day of our lives